I'm an Outer Man. You must be listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm your host, Big Anklevich. And I am Sir Rich Outfield. Sir Rich Outfield. Wow. Have you been knighted? Be knighted. Oh, I see. That makes more sense. <laughs> I figured the subject matter of today's story would be knightly. Oh, okay. Kira Knightley of us to refer to ourselves as that. That's one thing we'll never be able to do as a nightly show. <laughs> oh, that's true. Can't even get a weekly show. Jeez. W-E-A-K. <laughs> you said it, Rish. <laughs> anyway. All right. It's all about fun with punny words. Why does it seem like it's been so long since we've had an episode? I don't know. It actually hasn't. It's been less long than usual, I would say. Maybe I say that in every episode. <laughs> It has been a while since we got together to record because I had a couple of weeks where uh, we were unable to get together because I had to work nights and stuff like that. And now here we are face to face. Don't you dare go there. Couple of silver spoons, everybody. Yeah. Open the bed. Yeah. Prepare to die. But yeah, so that might be why you think it's been a long time. Well, it's also odd because not only are you using a new computer... But you're using a new recording device, so it feels totally brand new. Yeah, it's very different. I thought it would be a cool setup. I doubt it. Using the Zoom that I got for the ankle cast, instead of taking my poor aging grandfather of an iMac and plugging it in <laughs> and watching it limp along on its crutch, I just thought it might be easier. It might make that iMac last a little longer if we start using this. Well, yeah, anything that makes it easier. And if the sound quality, you say you can hear it. Yeah, it's just can as good. Can the folks at home hear a difference? They shouldn't because it's coming out of the same mic. All this thing is is a recorder. It's okay. It's no different. Than, and it actually might be a little better because if I close this, close the laptop, and now we have no computer going, so there's no fan. Of course, the fridge will kick on in a minute, and then we'll have a fan going, so there'll be more new noise. Yeah, and it sounds like somebody is doing construction elsewhere in your house, so. yeah. And of course, now that we don't is that have... a pile driver? What is that sound? <laughs> what is a pile driver? Isn't that a pile driver a wrestling move? <laughs> oh, what, is, what do you call the thing that breaks up concrete? <laughs> Jackhammer? Jackhammer. Oh, my. Everybody point at Rish and laugh. But yeah, now that we have uh, no fan going with the computer, that'll probably just mean every little shift in our chair will be that much louder. Do you think they could actually hear that uh, fan? They might have been able to. I don't know. It does sound like it's got less background noise going now. Cool. So it's good that we got it turned off. So anyways, today we have a story beyond just our usual yakking. The story is The Long Awaited by the author The Templar. It's just called The Templar, right? Not The Attack of the Night Templar by Edward McEwen. You sure you said that right? No, oh. but I'm going on anyways. Okay. <laughs> About the author. Edward McEwen is a writer and editor specializing in science fiction and fantasy with occasional forays into literary and nonfiction. Ed escaped from New York, but his old hometown supplies much of the background to his humorous Lair of the Lesbian Love Goddess shorts as his new hometown in Charlotte, North Carolina does for his Knight Templar fantasy series. He enjoys a wide variety of interests from ballroom dance to the martial arts and has the good fortune to be married to the talented artist Shelley Kiefer. He also has edited three Shah Da anthologies of Rai Tales of the Apocalypse and a wide variety of short stories. Ed is best known for his Robert Fenaday Shasti Rainhell series of SF novels, issued by Hellfire Publications. And who did the episode art for today's story? Funny you should ask. Actually, it's not funny at all. Um, it's sad? No, it's not even... It's just... You don't know who did the episode art. I do. I do. It's just kind of a normal question. There's nothing funny about it. It's just a regular answer. Uh, the guy who did the artwork is named Michael Church, and he's done all the covers for uh, Edward McEwen's stuff. And Ed just 
offered, hey, do you want to use the art from from the anthology that I have of all these uh, Knight Templar stories as the art for this thing? And so we said, yeah, and there you go. That's where it came from. Well, it wasn't funny, really, but um, that's the answer. Well, if I had been forced to create the episode art, it would have been funny. Yeah. You know, oh, not look funny, look away, it's so horrible. Not sort funny, of. ha ha. <laughs> it would have been one of those cockroaches wearing a Walmart vest, which is somehow <sighs> reversed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And also... You drew the cockroach instead of just putting a real cockroach and drawing the vest. I think I remember you talking about that. Saying, boy, it sure would have been easier if I'd started the other way. Today's story was produced by producer Extraordinaire. I'm sorry, what was that? Extraordinaire. That's a little hint of what's to come for you folks. Uh, Producer Extraordinaire, Brian Lincoln. Brian Lincoln. Brian Lincoln. Sure, just dig yourself in deeper. And Humiliation. That's right. He does uh, defecation. <laughs> he does. He does defecation. An amazing job with every production that he does, <laughs> more extensively than anybody else who works on our show. To the point where he has a documentary he creates on each episode to yeah, show how he did go. things. He's got a behind the scenes. It's the special features DVD that you can get. It's the director's commentary. Ooh, you got to try that sometime. That'd be funny. Although I don't know that you could do something like <laughs> that with <podcast>. audio. Because <laughs> it's the audio. They'd be like, right here is where you can't hear what's going on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Brian Lincoln, producer extraordinaire, is uh, the producer today. And we'll have a cast list for you on the other side. Meet you there. The Templar by Edward McEwen. Jeremy Leclerc, Knight Templar, ducked behind a pillar to get away from the cold drizzle blowing into South Park Mall's parking deck. He shivered under his black leather raincoat but could not close it for fear of slowing the draw of his blood sword. Nor did he want to stand in the shadows with a 30-inch blade drawn. Security at the mall wasn't good, but the weapon reflected any glimmer of light. Swords. Yet another way in which we have failed to enter the 21st century, he whispered, brushing dark brown hair out of his eyes. From the large, gold-encircled crystal that hung under his shirt, a sprightly female voice issued. Complaining again? Some hardy warrior. It's just water. Cold water, he said. Keep your voice down. Son of Adam, she said. Only you can hear me, unless I will it. Right. And I'm the one who doesn't need to be hearing you. I'm watching for a hideous human-eating beast from the underworld. Quit distracting me. Distracting? More like like keeping your sorry sorry self alive. Not Not all monsters are ugly bunches of muscles. This one might be gorgeous. And we don't know that this one eats the women. They just disappear. We know nothing about what we're up against. My guardian angel, he muttered, is a know-it-all pain in the ass. I sense something, she said. A hint of pain and terror in the wind. I fear we are too late. Damn it! Which way? North, by the cell phone tower. Jeremy ran down the ramp, avoiding the video cameras that he'd earlier noted. Then, he was out in the December mist, his feet splashing through shallow puddles as he raced out past the high-end restaurants, ducking behind SUVs and monstrous pickups to avoid the eyes of the miserable valets by McCormick and Schmicks. The rain and mist grew worse, curtaining him off from the mall and late holiday shoppers. Hmm, so much for America's sunny south, he muttered, putting his right hand on the blood sword's grip. The darkness next to him wavered, and Shadowheart appeared. As her blonde hair and blue shift did not cling, she'd only manifested as an image. Incarnation was difficult for her in the earthly realm. This is no natural storm, she said. 
Look. There. Where the streetlights have failed. Jeremy moved out, staring into a darkness that was more than the absence of light. Then he saw it. It drifted forward, one with the mist, towering over the nearby cars. The creature was a pale image of a woman, with colorless hair draped down its back, wearing a flowing dress. The rags of its dress and hair tossed in the wind. A grief-ravaged face of haunting beauty seemed to focus on the horizon. It was as if the rain and mist had taken their own mournful form. In one hand, it held what looked like a bunch of blood-soaked rags. In the other, hanging loose-limbed as only the dead can, was the body of a woman, well-dressed, a handbag dangling from her shoulder. Her wide, staring eyes and open mouth were stretched in horror. A banshee, Jeremy snarled. A sound reached him, a high, painful sound that might have been the wind sighing, but wasn't. The banshee sang its awful song. It raised the hand holding the corpse over its head easily fifteen feet in the air. The long, bony hand opened, and the corpse flew up into the sky and vanished. Jeremy's sword slid from its sheath as if eager. Its silver shone bravely in the low light. Jeremy rushed forward, weapon held high. Jeremy, you fool, no! Shadowheart called. The banshee's mournful face lowered to regard him. Its eyes were huge, dark pools that drew him in. Despair shattered Jeremy. <laughs> A howl of grief and pain burst from him as he stumbled to the ground, sword falling from nerveless fingers. Every loss he had ever experienced welled up fresh and painful as a new cut. The rain felt colder than the pit of hell, and his body shivered with ague. He managed to look up at the looming banshee with its soulless eyes and ravaged beauty. Its wind-like song filled his ears. Jeremy could only barely draw a breath. Back! A voice cracked. Suddenly, Shadowheart stood between him and the Banshee. But she was not the slender blonde teen. This Shadowheart towered over Jeremy in her black armor. Her green eyes, set in a heartless face, framed with midnight hair, blazed down at him. She turned to face the banshee, her great black and red wings spread between him and the apparition. Back! Shadowheart shouted. You will not have him! Energy surged between Angel and Banshee, causing a flickering, roiling disturbance of the soul and the very air. They extended hands toward each other, and the space between them shimmered. But across the link that bound him to Shadowheart... Jeremy instantly knew his guardian was overmatched and losing. While her wings shielded him from the worst of the Banshee's influence, he struggled to his feet, dragging the sword up with him, its point scratching the asphalt. He staggered away, somehow managing to keep his feet under him. Shadowheart, he sent. Run! Jeremy's strength returned with every yard he gained away from the creature. He paused between two cars and looked back. The Banshee was nearly invisible through its protective mist of fog and rain. It passed a streetlight, which dimmed and went out. Then the creature was gone. Jeremy heard the sound of wings over his head, and Shadowheart dropped from the sky to crouch alongside him. By the time she landed, the wings and black hair were gone, and she was her smaller blonde self. This time, she wore a fur-trimmed leather jacket and the usual paraphernalia of a mall rat. But when she stood, it was slowly, and her speech was halting. Jeremy, are you hurt? No. Free from the Banshee's baleful presence, only his knees and hands, scraped from falling to the pavement, troubled him. Are you all right? No. She said as rain dripped off her jacket. I am badly damaged. Jeremy, let us go into the mall and rest. You don't look hurt, he said, suddenly frightened. 
I had to fully manifest in this universe to fight the banshee in this plane, and I do not feel pain as you mean it, she said, starting forward. But I have taken injury from the beast. It is ancient and powerful. Jeremy followed her, sliding his sword into a hidden sheath in his coat. It will not pursue us? No, she said. Your life energy does not interest it. This one consumes only the female. It doesn't want you, he said. She gave him a slight smile and brushed rain off her face. My animus is female, but I am not of the race of Eve. My energy is hostile to the creature. He walked alongside her, concerned by the unsteady gait. After a few more steps, she leaned on him. She did not feel human. Her body was light and generated no warmth. But at least no one would walk through her. I'm sorry, he said. I thought... Well, I, I guess I didn't think. Something new about that? She snapped. They reached the side door to the mall. Passers-by likely took them for a couple on a date. The light of the doorway was welcome, but the tinkling Christmas music made Jeremy want to scream. Scream warnings to those walking out into the night. Shouts of his failure and his defeat. I am too hard on you, Shadowheart said, her voice gone gentle. Too hard because I am afraid and hurt and because you're young and reckless. You flung yourself at a monster that even I dread, and I rebuked you. Forgive me. It's only my wound speaking. What can I do? He whispered. How can I help? She pointed to an alcove in the food court. A quiet spot. Some hot chocolate from the caribou would be nice, too. It's outrageous what they charge, but what can you do? Jeremy left her in an alcove and hurried to buy two hot chocolates. His frantic looks back at Shadowheart seemed to charm the staff. As he grabbed the cups and headed off, he heard one girl say, Lucky biatch, I want a guy who is so eager to look after me. And he has such a cute French accent. Shadowheart leaned back in her seat, eyes half closed. But the sight of the chocolate made her sit up. Ah, <sighs> you know, God gave us chocolate. Jeremy strove for lightness. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said he gave us beer. She rolled her eyes and lifted the chocolate. Before Jeremy could warn her of the heat, she took a healthy swig. Shadowheart quickly finished hers and gave a sigh of contentment. <sighs> at her usual glance at his untouched cup, he quickly pushed it across to her. She sipped the second cup more slowly. Better? He asked. Yes, she said. Even talking with you is restorative. I am, after all, your guardian angel. But I am going to need to retreat to my crystal soon, and for an extended period. My guardian angel, he repeated. Shadowheart sighed. <sighs> this again? You have your own angel, and still you do not believe. Doubting Thomas has nothing on you. You say you're an angel. Clearly you're supernatural, but beyond that, who knows? It's not like you'll answer my questions about God and the universe. She sipped her chocolate. I keep telling you that it's forbidden. And I keep telling you that makes no sense. What are we, God's ant farm? Is there nothing good on TV in heaven? Why do we suffer? Why is there evil? What use am I supposed to have for a God who makes ridiculous rules? I'll be sure to tell him you said so. Please do. She frowned. What is it with you and rules? Whoever heard of a Taoist Templar? Not to mention what you did with the Oath of Chastity. I had my fingers crossed on that one. Obviously so did my father. Do you forget how we met and were sealed to each other? No, he said. It was very impressive. The Templar master took me to a door in the deepest part of Roslyn Castle one morning, yet it opened to a field under stars. What did you call it? The place between the worlds. So, how does an angel lose to a banshee? Your power comes from beyond space-time. I am not here to fight your battles for you, Jeremy. If you do not have free will, 
then you are merely a puppet. No, in the realm of Earth, I am severely limited by design. I am allowed to intervene only when there is a breach of order in the universe. The Banshee is of the space-time that man was meant to inhabit. My interference, by directly confronting it, made me vulnerable, as I was the one in violation. He looked at her calm, gentle face. Thank you. I'm grateful you don't always follow the rules. You must be rubbing off on me. I, for one, would be grateful if you could follow at least some of the rules. Suddenly she swayed and looked faint. Jeremy grabbed her by the shoulders. You're not going to... going to die, are you? Shadowheart steadied, then looked out over the throngs of holiday shoppers with their noise and packages, the running children busily ignoring the hapless adults trying to negotiate with them about their behavior. I am not alive, Jeremy, and cannot die. But in this earthly realm I can dissipate to where we are parted, and I am no longer me. I would pass to the hollow place, where I have no purpose, no function, and no reason for being. When I am not a guardian angel, I am nothing. Jeremy struggled to comprehend as he tore at his shirt, trying to pull out the crystal. Then go now. She put a calming hand on his arm, a light touch, like a bird settling. Soon, she said. But you must promise me not to fight the Banshee until I return. Jeremy pressed his lips together. That was the third woman murdered in two weeks. When will it strike again? Shadowheart shrugged. It's not a natural creature. It doesn't need to eat every day. It might not kill again for a thousand years, or it might kill a thousand times tonight. Is there something we could give it? He asked. Could we bargain with it? No, Jeremy. It is not a personality. It has no intelligence, no self-awareness. A banshee is more like an animated wish to kill. It's a fragment of matter from the beginning of time that has taken on this form. It exists on the borderline between life and unlife. Perhaps that is why it seems to hate and destroy the living. Am I to leave that horror to kill God knows how many while you recover? She frowned. The Banshee is an enemy beyond us. You cannot get close enough to strike with the blood sword. I cannot stand against it again. He slammed a fist to the table. A group of teens at another table turned around. They met his glare and returned to their cell phones. What harms the thing? He demanded. Iron. She said, her voice gone dull. All things of ancient fairy fear iron and steel. Her head nodded and then snapped up. Jeremy, I must go. Do nothing until I return. Suddenly he was alone in the food court. Jeremy spent the day recovering at his apartment. Shadowheart could be felt only by her complete absence. Worry about her health conflicted with a relief at being free of her badgering and not having to explain about who he was going to turn to for help. Hell, he thought. If she was mad about my breaking the rules before. He drew the blood sword from its scabbard and knelt on the rag rug in his living room. He pressed the cold gemstone to his forehead and concentrated. After a few minutes of strain, an image resolved. A bright red mouth. Sex, sharp teeth piercing flesh, blood flowing. Near midnight, Jeremy left for Charlotte's north side in his Mini Cooper, heading for the Aztec apartments. He drove into the run-down complex of 1980s-era slapped-up apartments. No one was out in the shadows of the aged buildings. Jeremy parked the small red car and waited. She exited from a second-story apartment, presumably her latest victim's, and walked toward the outside staircase. Piled masses of dyed blonde hair caught the streetlights. She wore a denim jacket over a sweater that looked like it might explode under the pressure of her bust line. Rhinestone-studded jeans and cowboy boots completed the picture. Jeremy got out of the car and walked over to face her at the bottom of the stairs. She paused briefly on seeing him, then came on, the heels of her cowboy boots tapping on the stairs. 
He placed a hand on the haft of the bloodsword and looked up at her. Her pale face and luminous blue eyes regarded him over generous, bright red lips. Why, Jeremy LeCleric, she said in a high country twang. I haven't seen you since I tied you to my four-poster and had my way with you two or three times. Three, he said. She smiled. It was a good night. How's your latest victim, Debbie? Oh, he's fine, honey. Got his feet propped up, lots of blankets. I made him drink a pint of Gatorade with some vitamins and left him on what remains of his bed with a smile on his face. I told you before, I don't have time to bury hundreds of corpses a year. I sip them and leave them happy. That's what I'll find if I check? Knock yourself out, sweets, but I did give you my word. Speaking of which, is our truce still holding? You at least owe a girl fair fight. Jeremy grimaced. He'd gone hunting Debbie alone, just after arriving in Charlotte and after a major tiff with Shadowheart. He'd ambushed Debbie in her lair, only to hesitate to strike the petite vampire. But Debbie hadn't hesitated, and with a strength that he hadn't anticipated in the small body, she'd wrenched the weapon from his hand and flung him on her bed. What started out as a desperate fight turned into foreplay as she played his body like Trey Cool played Green Day's drums. Hundreds of years had given her knowledge of anatomy that could make anyone into her bed toy. I promised that so long as you did not kill or turn humans, that you were safe from me, he said. Yeah, of course, I was uh, sitting on your chest and threatening to drink you dry if you didn't, he shrugged. A Templar may not claim duress. His word is inviolable. She smiled and came down the remaining stairs to take his arm. What brings you out looking for me? I mean, if it's a party you want, it'll have to be another night I'm beat. Jeremy couldn't help but smile at the buxom vampire. No party, thanks. But I need your help. There's a... Is this a long story? She said. I mean... I love listening to that European accent of yours and all, but... Kind of. Good. There's an all-night diner on Central. I love their food and the chocolate shakes. Didn't you just eat? I nourished my vampiric essence. She protested. Hasn't done anything for my tight little tummy. And being the undead, I can eat any damn thing I want and not gain an ounce. Jeremy drove them to the landmark diner on Central. To his surprise, the old Indian gentleman on the door knew Debbie and gave her a wink. He took them to a quiet corner booth. Debbie slid in and rested her formidable breasts on the tabletop. <sighs> she sighed. Try carrying these things around for a couple hundred years. Uh, yeah, he said, trying to keep his eyes on hers. A waitress... A slim, pretty girl with a ponytail walked up. Gail know what you want. You betcha. Debbie smiled. Big, thick steak with a pile of onion rings and a chocolate shake. How do you want that steak? The waitress laughed. Rare. Debbie said, rolling the R's. Now, how can you eat like that and have such a tiny waist? The waitress asked. Debbie batted her big blue eyes at her. I'm on a liquid diet most of the time, but better watch out, cutie. I might take a bite out of you. <laughs> the waitress giggled and blushed. Coffee and a Danish, Jeremy grumbled. The waitress walked off, with Debbie giving her a speculative look. Do you mind, Jeremy said. Come on, Jeremy, Debbie smiled. A girl always has to be thinking about where her next meal is coming from. And I sensed her interest. He started to speak, but she raised a hand. No business till after dinner. The meal came out quick and good. Jeremy watched in astonishment as Debbie ate enough dinner for two men, washing it down with chocolate shakes. Meanwhile, she chatted amiably. Debbie was a good small talker, a necessary skill to lure victims. So? She said with a sweet smile. Now that you've given a girl a propers, what can I do for you? You've heard about those women disappearing from the malls? Now, Jeremy, I had nothing to do with... I know, I know. He interrupted. It was a banshee. 
A what? She raised an eyebrow along with her shake. Banshee, he repeated. She sipped and shrugged. An ancient spirit of death and doom that appears as a ghostly image of a woman holding bloody rags. This one was over twelve feet tall. <laughs> You're funning me. What kind of a vampire are you? He threw up his hands. You think we get some sort of handbook for the undead when we turn evil for dummies? An Irish spirit of doom, he grated. It kills women for their life force, using despair as a weapon. It almost killed me last night. My guardian angel saved me, but she was badly hurt in the process and is recovering in the overworld. Good. <sighs> Debbie shuddered, tossing her blonde hair. Angels scare the crap out of me. Whoa, wait a minute. How does an angel lose against anything? Shadowheart can only intervene with her true power if some rule, which only she seems to know, is broken. When she saved me, she broke the rules and became vulnerable. She was nearly destroyed. Oh, too bad so sad, Debbie said. Be serious for a minute. Jeremy leaned forward. I need someone to act as bait for me while I find a way to kill it. You're the only powerful supernatural creature around here not likely to try and kill me. So I've come to you. And I do this why? She said, resting her chin in her hands. Money? He asked. She shook her head. Because it's the right thing to do? <laughs> it took a full minute for her to stop laughing. Jeremy, you kill me, sweetie. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. <sighs> what do you want, Debbie? I've got truce with you, she said. I figured it would be useful to have a good guy who owed me a favor. But I can't screw every Templar or other good guy into submission. Well, I could, but it would take a lot of time, and I might get unlucky and run into a gay one. There are no gay Templars, he said. Yeah, right. Don't ask, don't tell. Sure. Anyway, what I want is the same deal with all the forces of light. I don't kill or turn humans, and no one hunts me. A white pass, Jeremy murmured. There's only been three of those given in the last 500 years. Start a trend, she said. Jeremy considered. Having spared Debbie or truth be told, been spared by her, he'd studied all he could find on her. There was no record of Debbie killing anyone besides a serial rapist in the 1960s since the Civil War. There are dead that you slew after you first turned, he said slowly. She nodded. I had a few bad years with that bastard Ben Carrier after he turned me. Don't expect you to understand, or forgive, but... <laughs> I was dying of yellow fever at a Charleston whorehouse when Ben took me. I want revenge on the world for a while. Realized after a bit that all I was doing was making more of the same misery. Stopped. What happened to Carrier? I cut off his head and shat down his neck. I thought the expression was ripped off his head. He was strong. For a second, Debbie's facade of youth and good humor cracked. Jeremy was looking at something older and more dangerous. It was his turn to shudder. Perhaps, he thought. Debbie was as much sinned against as sinning. She was nothing like the vampires he'd trained to fight, being a creature more of dark sex than of death. His choice was to insist on retribution for ancient past sins or prevent present and future deaths. Debbie got coffee and had the waitress drop the bill on him while he thought. She looked out the window as traffic whipped by on Central Avenue. A horn sang in the distance. Very well, he said. As a Templar, I can speak for the Master. He speaks for all the forces of light. Do you understand Latin? My only foreign languages are Spanish and Yankee. I'll translate the ritual. We'll have to go to a church. Save your ritual, Jeremy, and I can't set foot in a church. Do we have a deal? I so bind the order and all forces of light, he said. 
on pain of death and excommunication, I extend the white pass to Debbie Middleton on behalf of the Knights Templar. The pass will be recorded in every database in the stone tablets of Joseph, and you will receive the traditional sheepskin and the ring of peace. The ring's aura will warn any soldier of light that you are protected. Great, she said, twinkling her fingers. I love bling. Right, he said. Here's the plan. We'll meet at 11 tonight by the symphony band shell. The mall is open late again. Jeremy and Debbie sat in a truck cabin in the outskirts of South Park Mall, where the blood sword had told him to expect the banshee. You didn't mention anything about a stolen truck, she said. You didn't steal it, I did. He shifted in discomfort. Mindful of what Shadowheart had said about the banshee fearing iron, he wore a chainmail coat under his Kevlar. And a leaf-sucking truck at that. What are we going to do, clean up Miles Park lawns? Shut up and duck, he said, grabbing her and pressing her down in the seat. A CMPD cruiser went by, its searchlight playing briefly over the truck as it scanned the distant reaches of the parking lots. Debbie turned from where her head lay in his lap. Did you want me to do something as long as I'm down here? Jeremy sighed. <sighs> the blood sword has never been wrong before. It's been hours, Jeremy. The windshield began to glisten with mist. Then a fine rain started. Mm, good sign. He said, starting the truck's motor. Says you. Debbie peered out the side window. Time for you to get out of there. Debbie opened the door and climbed down then looked back at him. Now, Jeremy, honey, you are going to back me up, right? Jesus fucking Christ, he said. How many oaths do I have to make to you? She grimaced. Vampire whores have trust issues, and don't swear. I will be there, my word to God. Didn't I hear something about you being a Taoist? Debbie. All right. Keep your shorts on. She strode off into the gloom and mist, which thickened by the second. He could barely see the glimmer of her blonde hair. Jeremy got out the other side, drawing his blood sword and adjusting the controls on the side of the vacuum truck. Then he slid under the huge metal drum of the dieseling truck as far back as he could and tried to be invisible. He couldn't see Debbie anymore, but comforted himself with the knowledge that she had better night vision than he did. A shriek split the air. Debbie came flying out of the darkness, her cowboy boots clacking like mad on the asphalt. For a busty woman, she was really making speed. Jeremy! On her heels came the banshee. It wailed its wordless song of misery and death. But Debbie wasn't listening. She plunged past Jeremy, still screaming. Jeremy! Behind her, the banshee, perhaps puzzled by Debbie's failure to succumb to its song, reached out a long, bony hand. As it strode past Jeremy, he plunged out from under the truck, striking a backhand. <laughs> the enchanted sword cut through the banshee's mist-like body without resistance, but its effect was immediate. The banshee howled in pain and bent double. Before Jeremy could cut again, its ghostly claws struck him. His Kevlar split under the Banshee's attack, but its hands rebounded from the chainmail beneath. Still, its mad eyes bore into him, chilling his soul, emptying his mind of purpose and his body of warmth. With his last fading rags of energy and will, he stabbed with the blood sword in his right hand and thrust the nozzle of the leaf sucker with his left, pulling its pistol grip tighter. heard the roar of the engine, then fell into darkness. The world came back slowly. <gasps> First with the sense of water falling on him and penetrating his clothes. Then the sound of the truck and its roaring vacuum. He opened his eyes to look up into Debbie's luminous ones. He lay in her arms, his head pillowed on her large, very soft breasts. Right, he thought muzzily. They're real. Did I get it? He asked. 
Yeah. She said. It disappeared up the nozzle and into the truck, but I don't think it's dead. I can still hear it. She shivered. He painfully craned his head around to look at the truck. The huge steel drum had evidently contained enough of the property of iron to keep the banshee contained. Jeremy groaned as she helped him to his feet. He felt a little woozy and reached up to his neck, finding some waterproof band-aids. He glared at her. Debbie? Oh, come on. She pouted. It was just a nip and a sip. You lose more when you cut yourself shaving. Take my car, he said, handing her the keys. Follow me. They pulled out of South Park and headed up Sharon Road to Independence Boulevard, then east on Highway 74. A half hour in a countryside road took them behind Bubba's auto salvage yard. Jeremy cut the chain on the fence, and they both drove in, heading for the auto crusher. As he pulled up and got out of the truck, Debbie parked next to them. Jeremy hopped out and looked up at the huge machine. Impact 5, it said on the side. It was an orange metal box with enormous pistons, used to flatten cars. Growls sounded behind him. Jeremy spun, his hand reaching for the sword. Three huge Rottweilers and a Doberman faced him. As they started to rush, Debbie jumped in front of Jeremy and drew herself up to her full five foot three inches and hissed. The dog stopped so fast that one somersaulted. Then all four fled, yelping into the darkness. Debbie gave him a smug look. Dogs are terrified of the undead. It's in Evil for Dummies, Chapter 4. <laughs> you ought to get yourself a copy. Jeremy hopped back into the truck and maneuvered it into the massive crusher. The whole machine wouldn't fit, so he backed the metal cylinder in. Debbie, start her up. Oh, hell. She said. Now he thinks I'm the damn mechanic. Let me throw some switches. As Jeremy turned off the truck, a gray mist emerged from the dashboard vents, manifesting as ghostly claws. Somehow, the banshee had found at least a partial outlet. Debbie! He shouted as the claws struck. Uh. There wasn't enough room to pull his sword, but even half-drawn, it cut the ghostly hands reaching for his throat. No use yelling at me, she shouted back. I'm going fast as I can. No, he yelled again. The claws struck, and his arm went numb. He switched hands and whipped the sword around in his sheath. One claw dissipated. The other struck, and his left leg went numb. With a sound like an old Star Trek phaser, the Impact 5 came to life. Massive jaws pinched down on the back of the truck, drawing it in and crushing it. The Banshee gave a dreadful howl from its imprisoning cylinder as metal was driven into it. Its final shriek of agony and despair almost made Jeremy pity it. The machine cycled, dragging more of the truck into it, with Jeremy still in the cab. The roof over his head started to buckle. Jeremy struggled, but his half-frozen body betrayed him. The door hung in its bent casing, holding him. Debbie! He screamed. He let the sword slip back into its sheath and threw his shoulder at the door. Debbie leapt to the truck's runner, wrenching the door off the frame with inhuman strength. Grabbing his arm in a way that made him glad it was numb, she yanked him out of the cab. They thumped onto the oil-soaked ground. Diesel fuel spilled out of the ruptured tanks, and the truck burst into flames. Debbie threw him up on her shoulders, and they sprinted for his mini. By the time they reached the car, Jeremy's body again responded to his demands, though his arm felt like it had been pulled from its socket. They jumped into the mini and roared out of Bubba's. An hour later, Jeremy let Debbie out by her pink VW bug. She smiled. You sure know how to show a girl a good time. Thanks. He managed. Just let me know when my white pass is ready. I'm looking forward to getting my new ring. I'll call the Grandmaster and have it FedExed. 
Jeremy drew a breath. I owe you. She looked at him, her smile fading. Jeremy, honey, I like you, so I'll tell you a couple of things. Don't get too fond of me. I ain't good for you or anyone living. You are a little too trusting and way too naive. Try not to get killed. Deal. Sunrise soon. Uh, better get on the ground. She shook her head and sashayed off toward her car. Jeremy drove home, staggering up the 36 steps to his uh, top floor uh, apartment. Uh, he gratefully uh, made it to his bedroom, uh, collapsing across uh, the bedspread, fully dressed, too hurt uh, and miserable to draw the curtains. He stared at the rising sun. Suddenly, Shadowheart stood in the room. Sunshine streamed through her simple blue shift, and her golden hair made banners on the wall. She vibrated with health and energy. I'm back! She sang, spreading her arms. Restored and returned. She danced her little joyous dance to greet the sunrise, smiling beatifically at all God's creation. Then she turned to Jeremy, who lay unmoving on the bed, glaring at her from one open eye and stinking of oil and smoke. You look like crap, she said. Author's Note <laughs> The Jeremy LeClerc stories were for Charlotte and Fantasy what my earlier Lair of the Lesbian Love Goddess series was for New York City and SF. A chance to have good-natured fun with the place I'm living. Jeremy is kind of a version of me, trying to get the answers to life's little mysteries, as Detective Guy Noir says, only he has an actual guardian angel to put the questions to. He finds that being face-to-face -face with angels, demons, and devils doesn't help as much as you would expect. So while he's up to his eyeballs in sexy vampires, hot red-headed girls who are actually jaguars, and the assortment of good-looking witches, he also has to put up with an enigmatic and snarky angel who either appears as an annoying mall rat kid sister or a black-haired, green-eyed Xena warrior princess with wings. All of the Jeremy stories are collected in the recent anthology, Night in Charlotte, available at Amazon.com. We'll start in with a cast list straight out of the author's note, which we'll do later when we do all the other stuff. You don't even have a cast list? Uh, I think I do, but... Creature... Of the night. Cat out there. Didn't see any. Okay, so our cast list is as follows. <clears throat> Rish Outfield was our narrator. Big Anklevich played Jeremy Leclerc, also known as the Templar. Starla Hutchton was our guardian angel. Mm. Catherine Pride was our vampire. Oh, she was rad. L. Scribe Harris was the waitress, and Kathy Bowler was the Bane Seed Hay. Cool. What the crap? Also known as the Banshee. Hey. And she was also the Mall Girl. Ah. So wait, wait, did Brian not do any voices? Brian did not do any voices. He's more machine than man now. He hmm. did um, create some farting sounds, but he wound up not using them in the uh, final production. <laughs> I sent him some of my own farting sounds, too, and he didn't use them either. I'm, I'm surprised. What, what did, was there a depiction of... Was there a reference to farting sounds in the, the text? Itself? I don't believe so. Oh. But, okay. you know, I'm sure here and there you could have used them for some kind of a sound effect. Maybe if you speed it up and maybe lower the pitch and put a little reverb on it. It's already a lot of reverb <laughs> on it. This one was so, so long in coming. That's what she said. That's right. <laughs> and most of the reason for that was I was super intimidated by the, how are we going to do the Bane C Day sound? <laughs> uh, I mean, there's another thing. Well, before we go there's any so further, many things I want to talk about. Yeah. Before we go any further and say Bane C Day again, we probably ought to explain to folks what the hell we're talking about. Okay. So let me tell you real quick. The original spelling or the traditional spelling the or, I don't know, the Gaelic spelling, if you could use such a word like that on a, a show like this, it came with the the spelling of Banshee, 
which I guess is how they spelled it. I don't know. Did they even use like Gaelic? Did they use Roman letters? I would think so. Or was it those like tattoo? You know, you've seen that that uh, Celtic ring or whatever it is kind of a thing. Did they have like crazy letters like that? I, I, I have no idea. Maybe it's the Gaelic spelling or whatever. But anyways, it's the spelling of it not like you would expect. It's not spelt like it sounds. The Bain Seed Hay, which is B-A-I-N space S-I-D-H-E is apparently the uh, original spelling of the word Banshee. I was so disappointed when I discovered that. I honestly thought that Edward had created his own you know, his own monster in this. And it was a Bane Sea Day. And it was unlike anything that we'd seen before. And it's terrifying and unknowable and full of dark feminine energies and, and all this stuff. And then I don't even remember how I discovered that it was just Banshee. I think but you, I you wanted to reject up? the f-ing story when I heard that. <laughs> it so disappointed me. <laughs> to the point where despite we took the story, but he kept insisting that he was going to still pronounce it Bane Seed Hay. During right. the, uh, even to the point where we got to the first part where the word comes up and I was the one that said it. He looked at me like, no, you can't do that. And I'm like, no, I am doing that. We are saying it correctly as we insist with all words on the show. We never pronunciate them. We pronounce them correctly. And so, I yeah, know. I insisted upon it. But Rish is still pretty upset. I still would rather have gone the other way. And so for the rest of the show, you will probably hear him refer to it as Bane Seed Hay. Definitely. So back to uh, what you were doing before I interrupted you. Do you even remember what it was? I can't remember. But there was a long time that this story just sat fallow. We had accepted oh. it. But we weren't going to produce it. You it, were saying you were intimidated with the Bane Seed Hay song, I think. Yeah, that was a big thing of it. I had read the story and part of my one wanting to produce it was how would we create the song of the Bane Sea Day, something that's terrifying and feminine and mysterious and all that stuff I said before. I had it in my head that, okay, what we'll do is we're going to get Big's children to sing some like unearthly tune, some like minor key, like creepy little tune. And then we'll just like play with the pitch and the reverb and all that. So it will become the demon sounds that I so love or whatever. And just how eerie would that be? And, you know, maybe make it even higher and it will sound wrong because it's children. And people won't realize instantly, oh, that's children. They'll be like, no, there's just something wrong with that woman's voice or whatever it is. And uh, <laughs> I, I think I was just too intimidated by that. I, it thought, was, I, I think it was partly that and also partly because you had several other things that were on your plate. And you realized you wouldn't be able to eat them all. And so you gave Brian your scraps. <laughs> well, ultimately, yeah, we didn't even give him the recording of your daughter's. We just let him create the sound as he wanted to. And gosh, I hope on full cast, he talks about how he created that. Because like I said, that was the biggest challenge for me in my mind, aside from saying Banshee. (laughs) Uh, It's a really hard word to say. Because you could go in any number of directions on that. And since I've been doing audiobook production myself I've, I've, it's just been amazing to me how much how many directions you can go how you can interpret the same line of dialogue how am i going to do this uh, what voice am i going to use should there be an accent and, and you know how do i keep them straight in my mind and all that and brian could have done anything he could have had something really banal or he could have followed the walt disney uh, Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Do you remember how scary that banshee call was in Darby O'Gill? And basically it was just a wailing woman, which is what a Bane is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was such a creepy sound. And what he did, I have no idea how he did it, but it's almost like an unearthly alien sound, like created by a machine, not by a human being. I, I, I don't know. I, did, did the sound upset you at all? Not upset, but creep you out? I was so upset. Like the whole day, I couldn't... I was argumentative. I was I was angry. I you yelled at my children. Yeah, yeah I got, it was really upsetting. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> well, see, I wish that we had Brian here. And one day, I guess we need to do like a Skype call episode yeah, and have we, Brian be one of our people. We meant to do that. Was it with this one? Wait, or the didn't one we before? do it with Harlan's Wake? We meant to do it with Renee. She was the other one that we were going to do it with. And then we just wound up not doing it because we didn't have time or something like that. So we did do that with him. So he's had his chance. He's 
he's not coming back. Forget him. But hopefully he, he talks about that and he gives that a lot of weight because I don't know how he did it. It uh-huh. didn't sound like, oh, OK, well, he just took, a, I don't know, an accordion and played it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He just scraped his hand on a blackboard while rubbing a balloon. <laughs> wet fingers. While chewing tinfoil. <laughs> oh, wow. Went from a sound to just an awful thing. <laughs> This story was fun. It it was more of an adventure story than a, a deep philosophical kind of a thing. It was really enjoyable. It made me think a lot of, do you know the name of the guy that's the Dresden Files? Butcher. Yeah, that's it. It kind of reminds me a lot of Jim Butcher's uh, Dresden Files books where you have this guy that's set in the modern world. He's just there and all this stuff is going on in the modern world. But, you know, it's like just beyond our site or you know it's just stuff that you don't quite pay attention to or something you know what i mean i always think that's really interesting it's kind of even like a harry potter so you know where they're just they're there but you as regular us muggles don't notice we don't notice that the templars are there fighting banshees i'm a squib myself but yeah i've heard that about you i really like that idea the idea of something like that put into the modern world and the, a lot of the books that I read growing up were like Piers Anthony books where he had magic involved, but the world was always different. Either the magic wasn't part of the world, you know, you had to go to Xanth, which, you know, was somehow separate despite it being Florida. Or it was just a totally different world where like magic and science were all kind of combined and it was just, you know, a different dimension or whatever you want to call it, a different universe. I really like it just thrown in and uh, yeah, it's just all there. I actually have a kind of an idea like that where uh, people in modern world discover magic and they sort of become superheroes because of it. It just seems really interesting. I, I really like that kind of a thing. And if you guys liked this story, I guess chime in. Make yourself heard. Let us know because apparently there are nine other templar stories out there when we first accepted this there were two (laughs) so if you'd like to hear more let us know and and uh, i'm pretty sure ed would be happy to supply us with some i don't know if he'd be happy to wait the wait it will take for for them to come around again but uh he may have sold all the other eight already (laughs) yeah probably no there's nine i think ten altogether so nine unheard stories what uh you got to voice jeremy leclerc jeremy leclerc and yeah what how how did you go about that and was that a challenge for you it was a challenge i'm not you know it's funny because i listened to myself and i actually think that i sound fairly convincing which i didn't expect when i i heard myself do the first line i was like oh no this is going to be bad Because, you know, we recorded it a while ago, and then Brian did his thing and his magic and sprinkled some pixie dust on it, and all of a sudden it's this great thing that we have. Um, And yeah, hearing it again, it's been long enough that I'd forgotten even that I did the French accent for the story. And so, yeah, hearing it, it made me a little nervous as to how bad it was going to be, but I don't think it was terrible. I don't know, maybe you did. (laughs) Well, if he had been one of those typical Frenchmen in a story that would say things in French from time to time under his breath, or, you know, he always curses or he's Zut a one. and all that, would that have been more difficult for you? Not really. I actually took two years of French in high school. So, I mean, it's not just going to be good because, I mean, in high school, you actually don't learn anything in your English class or I mean, in your language classes. My wife actually took six years of French and can do less with French than I can from the two years. But I guess, you know, she's Canadian, so you have to take six years of French or something like that. It's required by law, just like putting both languages on the signs. But as long as it wasn't too intense of French, I could probably pull it off. Uh, pronouncing it okay but you know the guy who did the voice of the french boy from uh hang up and try again one of our episodes from way back when would hear me do it and go oh crap this guy sucks 
But <laughs> luckily, you know, uh, there's only so many people that would do that, though. You know, the people that actually speak French and speak it well would be like, make it stop. My stomach hurts. There wasn't an Appalachian accent. That was a general <laughs> Southern accent. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like most regular folks are probably not going to be too turned off by it. And I don't think I would have been afraid to do it. But, yeah, I thought it turned out okay. I was um, kind of impressed. I, I figured I would have been worse than I was. So that's good. You've been listening to old episodes of our show for some reason instead of writing, I would assume. <laughs> Pretty um, much. That's why I was looking for something else that I could do that's less productive. And you were telling me today how much more confident we have become as podcasters just from doing it so much and our as our we become more comfortable in our personalities and all that or just you know i guess we apologize less right now uh how, how different is your jeremy leclerc now than he would have been if in 2009 we'd gotten this story i think it's substantially different uh, i think doing this show has also made me a much better actor aside from just being confident i'm i'm, I'm able to pull stuff off a lot better than i used to I guess being confident is part of it because I'm less afraid to do something silly or risky or whatever. I'll just do it. And then you're over there like shaking your head and doing the face palm. And I just ignore that now. I don't worry about the face palms. Whereas back then, you know, the endless face palms that you would do as you sat next to me, they would disturb me more. I would think, oh, no, I'm terrible at this and uh, I got to do better. Um, now I'm just like, pff, F him. Who cares what he has to say? Because he's a jerk. Okay. <laughs> but I think it would have been a lot different, probably. It would have been a little more over the top. It would have, I would have sounded much more like the French cook from The Little Mermaid. Do give us a little sample of that, of that, that song. No way. Zut I have missed one. I would have probably found some way to get in the ha <laughs> laugh. <laughs> <laughs> What's that stuff you with bread? It don't hurt because you're dead. Right? And you're certainly lucky you are because it's going to be hot in that big fryer pot. <sighs> Looks like we're out of time. Siposo, what was it? I don't, I don't remember what? how it goes from there. But I thought at one point he went, Yeah, he does. The one bummer about it was I'd forgotten that they mentioned any. Uh, French accent in that story. So when we went to read it, I remember we're like, oh no, this guy has to have a French accent. And I think we debated back and forth who should do it. And we remembered that you had once done the character of the dashing Frenchman in uh, the Clob stories. Wait, wasn't I also the girl that he was seducing? He's like, oh, Zave. Uh, yeah. you... I Zave. But uh, yeah, you were once the uh, Frenchman in that one. And so I, I oh, so think, it was your turn. No, I think we were thinking, oh yeah, you've done for you, you, you can pass it off once. Maybe you can do it again. But I don't know. Somehow I managed to be the guy that did it. Maybe it was my turn. I don't know how I wound up with that, or maybe it was just because you were already narrating, so I had to be the guy. Well, did Brian assign those roles to us? Typically, when somebody produces the show, they get to cast it too. Yeah, he probably <laughs> did, but I don't remember. It's weird. I guess it's just because it's been so long. We got so slow, you know, this is one of those, I think when we accepted this story, it was right at the very end, uh, you know, we'd already closed submissions and we were just reading off the last of the stories that we had left with the submissions closed. And this was one of the last ones that we got, I think, before we closed them. And so it was at the very, very end of our list of stories. And so it's been hanging around for a long time. The, the process was slow enough that I've forgotten all the things that uh you know came up along the way well yeah that's that's kind of the process when when you go into this level of production i mean that sounds arrogant i guess but we could put things out so much faster if it was just a straight read i'll do this one you do that one true but it, it's a different show and you know i think we've done stories where it's been maybe not a straight read exactly but it's very minimal sound effects just you and me Mm -hmm. uh, just doing all like the parts that, yeah. and all that. And, and it makes it faster, but it's still... Don't we always put music? Don't we always do sound effects? At least some? Yeah, we pretty much always do some. Like Although, when you did... The, the one that you did of my... We did the live reading in Vegas of... Wedded Bliss. Wedded Bliss, thank you. 
And that was something that we that we recorded in like 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. But how long did it take to produce an episode of the 25 minute recording? It wasn't all that long. I did. I, it was a low sound effects uh, kind of a thing. You know, the only thing I did was take the music and make it sound like it was coming out of a crappy radio. And then I put a little bit of sound effects of like kids running around and making noise. And here and there, I put a burger being flipped. I did hear that. Was it Travis Tritt? It wasn't Travis okay. Tritt. No, it was a guy named Richie Reinhardt, I want to say. Got from Jamendo, you know, this the standard uh, place that you can get Creative Commons music. But yeah, it was... Uh, a pretty simple production as far as the sound effects went, which is good because it would probably still not be out <laughs> if it wasn't. Yeah, I hear you. And the, the level of production that Brian always puts into things would frankly take me six months to do. Right. And we've talked about Brian a million times. I mean, he just he wants to challenge himself. He wants to outdo himself. He He's in a race and the only participant is himself. He must just have that kind of personality where he, he takes the road less traveled and uh, as far as the parsec awards that has made all the difference <laughs> yeah his show has one nomination and one victory and our show has what five <laughs> six nominations and still zero victories yeah i guess it does make a difference maybe we <laughs> ought to try a road less traveled a, a race against ourselves it's a race just to get an episode out a month, man. <laughs> yeah, it has become that, sadly. Sometimes I still marvel at what we were able to do before, because we used to seriously, we'd put out like three episodes a month at least in the old days, and there were even a time or two where we had four episodes, an actual four-episode month. How could you? No idea how I managed to do that, because I, at that point I was doing most of the stories by myself. And you were doing the episodes, I would do the story, and we'd put it together at the end. And whew, I don't know how I did it, man. I don't either. I, it's not like you have significantly less time now. I mean, well, you've got one more kid, but you've still got the same job. You've still got the same commute. You've still got... That's true, but you'd be amazed at what d- a difference that one kid <laughs> does to my free time. But I also would think that there's been a learning curve with production... And let's say Enter Sandman by Jeff Carlson came onto your desk today, you'd be able to do it faster and better than you did in 2009. Probably. If not, then you've learned nothing. (laughs) The funny thing is we've gotten other people as our producers to the point where I'm rusty. When I was doing uh, Wedded Bliss, I found that I, I was having, you know, I used to know exactly where all the sound effects were. I could find them in an instant. Be like, oh, I need this sound effect. Oh, okay, I know where that is. That's this one. And I could search the right thing and it would come right up and I could get it in there. And now I'm just like, oh, gosh, what was that? That, I know I have one that works for that. Which one was it? (laughs) Oh, man. And so I guess it slowed me back down. I've gotten rusty. I've gotten old. So this is the, what, the third story we've done by Edward McKeever? Yeah, and no, it's actually the fourth. Oh, really? Story we've done by Edward McKee. Okay, wait, wait. He did, he did final exam, right? That was the first story that he had on our show. Really? Okay. All the way back in two thousand something. I'm sure it was two thousand something. <laughs> two thousand nine, and then after that, we had one of our uh, favorite stories of all time: Open Twenty Four Hours. Which was also done by him. If you want to give us a sample of it, go. <laughs> Welcome to Earth, Matt. <laughs> Open 24 hours for your shopping convenience. Oh, my. I didn't even have to speed that up. That was my <laughs> real voice. Although, hey, there's a preview of the baby voice, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, that one he, we did back in 2010, about a year after the other one. A little bit less than a year after the other one. And then also... His story was Must Have Own Weapons. That was him too. Yeah. That one we did in 2011. So he's had a story every year except for 2012. Templar didn't make it in. We took too long with it. That's too bad. You know, sometimes I wish that that we could clone ourselves just so I wouldn't have to sleep alone. Um, Yikes. But (laughs) it's a shame. Yeah, we missed a whole year without an, an Edward story. Yeah, and there was no good reason for it other than that we're just too slow now. 
we're the children that it's talking about when you're driving down the street and it says caution slow, slow children, children playing play. that's uh, us we're I the think, slow children i think that gets my goat has eaten into a lot of our podcasting time too if, if they, we didn't have a second podcast we would focus a lot more on the primary on the one podcast we have and we'd have a lot more episodes i guess that's probably true but our episodes would be immensely longer because all the crap that we say on That Gets My Goat would therefore be in the regular podcast. Welcome to hell. Yes, I hear you. I see. I need That Gets My Goat. It's now that I do like the, I'm making quotes in the air, professional audiobook reading and all that stuff. Oh, I so look quotes. forward. I so look forward to just like editing our conversations where I don't even have to put the headphones on. And if there is a mouth sound and all that, who cares? And, and, you know, if we had to cut something out and you can tell that something has been cut out, it doesn't matter. I, 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 me making that noise isn't the end of the world, you know? It, so I will be editing or, or recording stories or whatever. And it's just like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Let me edit one of our shows. Yay! It's weird that in just... Two, three months, I see Dune Stephen that gets my goat in a whole new light as a, a vacation podcast. It's right? now fun again. It had turned to crap until you got something even crappier. I and wish now there was some fun. way to make you feel the show was fun again. <laughs> I still think the show is fun, especially, the, you know, I mean, uh, you've said this as you talk about your whole audiobook gig, how your favorite part is doing the recording. Oh, yeah. And all the rest that comes after that, unfortunately, is the not favorite part. And I totally find that to be the same way. I totally enjoy. And I would, I will keep the podcast going just because I really enjoy sitting here out at my kitchen table and chatting with you about whatever the frick we want to chat about. Even There's if it's one episode a month or one episode every two months <laughs> or whatever, I just enjoy it. But the funny thing is, you know, we talk, we, we, we apologize a lot for having very sparse episodes, but when it comes down to it, we actually do a whole lot of stuff. I, I started doing this thing. I'm, I'm putting it together, and it looks like it's going to be a really long process, so don't get excited as I tell you about oh, it right shoot, now. Oh, shoot. Are you having another kid? Dude, but, <laughs> how can you not learn? I'm putting together this thing that I'm, I'm, I'm calling it the Omnibus Feed. Although I did call it an Uber feed a little too. So maybe it'll get named that. We'll have to see. But it's a Steve feed that includes all the Steve content. Because for years we've been doing our main show, this one here that has the stories on it. And then we started doing That Gets My Goat. But before we even started doing That Gets My Goat, we started doing outtakes and extra stuff that people... What's your you know, favorite they were, Johnny Depp movie? Yeah, there were Easter eggs that were just hidden on the post for the story that were the outtakes or they were just little stupid things that we recorded just for fun to put on there. And so we've had all those things going all this time. And then we have That Gets My Goat. And I just recently started up my own little kind of ankle cast, I call it, where I talk about what's going on with me. And if you add those things all up, like I started making this Uber feed and I just took the stuff from the start of this year. I, I started out with the from now until January 1st, you know, that first few months. And there's like 20 things that we've got on there in that amount of time. And we didn't even do a marathon this year. Yeah, there was no marathon, no Dupo Remo or anything like that. And yet we've still got that many things in that short of a time. So we actually do quite a lot. It's just not all this one show anymore. We've kind of expanded it out to a whole family of shows so you know if if you don't if you can't get enough dune steve from just listening to our main show well you know there's other outlets and soon enough when i get the uber feed put together if you donate to the show then you'll get a link that tells you where to find the uber feed and you can subscribe to that and get it all in one place so you won't have to go to all the different places like you have to now huh of course, if we had people volunteering to produce stories for us, we'd probably have more episodes of this. The production takes the longest time. That's true. You and I can spend 90 minutes recording a story, but then when you have to spend three weeks editing it. We do actually have a fair number of people that are willing to uh, produce for us, though, to the point where we can't even necessarily keep up with them either anymore. So we've got to up our uh, content, I guess. Maybe we need to write more stories. Well, definitely. We are both writing stories, man. We announced recently a contest 
which yeah, uh, we're in the midst of right but... now. We're calling it the triple word score contest, which probably will give us a lot more content, right? I'm I'm pretty sure that'll give us a bunch of stories, judging by how many people have put their hat in the ring. They, they threw their hat over the wall. So I don't know. Is that the right phrase? Do you put your hat in the ring? That's what somebody said, but I don't know. Where would that come from? How do you sign up for something by putting your hat in a ring? Well, maybe it was a, a boxing term from back in the gentleman's boxing days. Yeah. And you put your hat there to say, I will fight in the next match. Maybe. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, there's several people that are in on it. And uh, I think we'll have a bunch of stories. Hopefully lots of them are good so we can use lots of them. Because um, that's kind of what we've always used is the cutoff. We get to the point where, okay, yeah, somewhere. It's usually my story is just under the good mark. And all the rest of the stories that are good are just above that. Yeah, the my dream would be just so that we get like seven or eight that are just great stories. And it's like, okay, I'll take this one. You take that one. We'll get, we'll see if Marshall will come out of retirement and he'll produce one. Because they're all short stories. Yeah. You know, things like that it would just be so much fun where it's like, dude, we could do this weekly if we wanted to. We've got nine that are all done. You know, I, nine, I'm sorry. We've got two that are all done. <laughs> I got to be realistic with my dreams. But yeah, there is a lot of stuff. And we've got a lot of stories in the works that are uh, on their way. Stories from... You she, and from me. I can't think of the guy's name. It's just gonna, us. That's I it. I was going to say the dude that did Tether to the Cold and Dying, the guy that did Beachcombing, Ray Cluley. <coughs> but yeah, and, and that's the one thing that we're especially trying to get is get more stories by us on there. And we've been writing them and we've got some uh, ready that we need to produce them. Maybe next week we'll read some of them and start assigning them off to folks. Because we've got various producers who are now done with their stories and we'll need another one. Hmm. So maybe we'll have to do that. I hadn't even considered that other people would produce stories that we wrote, but I guess they would. I would hope, but <laughs> maybe they won't. Maybe they'll say, F you guys. <laughs> it's your story. Do it yourself, you jerks. Hmm. Um, I guess we'll see. <laughs> so th those kind of things are on the way and they'll be good. They'll be good fun. And, of course, we'll still have a story here and there that isn't by us. We'll have a Catastrophe Baker story from Mike Resnick. Maybe we'll have another Templar story. No, oh, hell no, Big Anchorage. <laughs> Whoa. It's wow. been a long time. Slightly offensive guest star. Where did that guy come from? That's none of your business, Big Anchorage. <laughs> okay, I can't even do him anymore. <laughs> it's like you and your wife. Okay, enough of that. We've reached the late portion of our, our program. <laughs> And we should have signed off long ago. Yeah. All right. Well, we will uh, go ahead and do that. It looks like uh, that's it for the show today. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve folks. Yes. Thanks. A wait. Wait. Just before we go. No, no. No time. No, it, it'll just take a second. Dune Steve, that word. It's, oh, uh, it's uh -huh. been bugging me forever. What does Dune Steve mean? Is it from something? Yeah. It's a famous man in history. His name was Donald Dune Steve. Okay. Yeah. That's what we named it after. Wait, 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 what, who was Donald oh. Dunsty? Oh, right, I guess that would help, huh? He was actually the first man to claim that he liked ABBA, ironically. He didn't really, it was... Ah. Oh. Is that irony? I don't... And, oh, jeez, don't get me that... started on that. You're right, we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian Lincoln, for producing our story this week. And thank you, Edward... Thank you for sending us this story and giving us something wonderful to put on our show. And thanks to all the voices that helped us out this week. And thanks to you, Rish Outfield, for sitting across the table and chatting about whatever the crap we feel like chatting about. Oh, well, hey, thank you. And, and don't fear the Bainsey Day. <laughs> That's right. La, 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 la. <laughs> Nor do the wind and the sun and the rain. <sighs> Thanks for listening, folks. See you next time. Your mountain is waiting. So get the f Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, your meandering put me to sleep. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, 
but you may not charge for them or alter them. So long and thanks for all the fish. Take two. Edward McEwen is a writer and editor specializing in science fiction and fantasy with occasional forays into literary and nonfiction. Is that for literary or nonfiction? <sighs> Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.